LinkedIn buys Lynda.com, Amazon sues sleazy purveyors of five-star reviews, and Google readies an iPhone app for Android Wear. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 313 for Thursday, April 9th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash T-N-2. Welcome, I'm Megan Maroney. Today, LinkedIn announced their acquisition of online education company, lynda.com, for $1.5 million. Full disclosure, as you just heard, lynda.com sponsors Tech News Tonight. In fact, they have been an advertiser on Twit for a while. But this is the biggest headline of the day, and we invited Jason, Jason Abruziz, business editor at Mashable, to talk about the unbiased coverage, talk about his unbiased coverage of the acquisition. Now, why did LinkedIn acquire lynda.com, Jason? I mean, with this acquisition, they get really one of the most established, one of the most experienced uh, online education platforms on the Internet. Um, the people behind lynda.com have been doing this as long as anybody uh, really, you know, going back to, uh, you know, Web 1.0 era with, you know, online tips. Uh, you know, in the last few years, they've really scaled up and, and become a leader in providing high quality kind of, you know, subscription worthy, uh, you know, education content. And I think, you know, when LinkedIn sees that, they see kind of a premium, uh, a premium content thing like that that lines up with so much of what they want to do. You know, it makes a lot of sense. And, and, and it also kind of explains, you know, why the, uh, the, the pretty massive price tag. Right. Yeah. It's, it's their biggest acquisition ever, right? Yeah, it's not, even, not even close. I, I think, you know, there's a couple, uh, you know, over 100 million, but I don't think they, they've even bought anybody for over 500 million before. So for the, uh, the you know, one and a half billion, that's, that's, that's a big move, but it's certainly, you know, well within their means, LinkedIn's done pretty well lately. Uh, both, you know, uh, in in you know generating cash from their business. You know, they, it's nice they have you know multiple revenue streams, unlike a lot of other places, because they get so much subscription money. Uh, they have enterprise deals, and you know the deal is almost half stock, and their stock has been doing pretty well lately too. So that's a nice tool to be able to kind of be um, you know have in your pocket, so you don't have to shell out you know 1.5 billion dollars in cash. Right. So, so where, what are their biggest revenue streams? Do they get most of their money from just subscribers, people looking for jobs, or is it more from the enterprise that they get most of their money? LinkedIn. From my recollection, it's it's three pronged and it's pretty balanced. So certainly, you know, they get a lot of money from people who you know want that premium membership so that they can uh, you know you know make contacts, find jobs, things like that. But their enterprise side is 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 arguably their strongest part because there's not a lot of people I think that can compete with them. Uh, on the job seeker side, you know, you have other websites, you have, you know, your monster.coms and things like that. Uh, but, you know, what, what LinkedIn's doing as far as, you know, being a place that recruiters are going to want to go and companies that are looking for talent, you know, want to go to, LinkedIn's, you know, pretty far ahead of everybody else, it seems. And, uh, you know, while these education courses are great for individuals, and, and, and that's, you know, I think they're most consumer public facing, uh, lynda.com does, you know, do uh, a lot of enterprise work already. So I think for LinkedIn, it was an opportunity to add to kind of both sides of that with, with you know, a, uh, an established brand. So the idea is that, you know, say I'm looking for a job at Google, then Google would have lynda.com videos that are would be all of the skills that I would need. Is that, that what they might do with these? Like before you apply, make sure you have these skills kind of thing? I, I think it could be, yeah, make sure you have these skills. I think they could, you know, if I'm Google and I say like, I want to get all of my uh, all of my employees in this sector up to speed on uh, CSS or or you know a certain type of graphic design, I can say like, all right, well, we've got a uh, you know a ready-to-go program to do that, and um, you know I think that's that's you know nice for a lot of companies that are now figuring out how to train up their employees and to retain talent. So, is there any um, have have we got any hints about whether the videos will be just used for people who pay for LinkedIn, or will they? Do we know that if they'll be available to even non-paying people who used LinkedIn? Not sure yet. I'd have to imagine LinkedIn does want to use this to get more people in the door. So if you're looking to to learn skills, there might be some free stuff out there. Um, you know, it's going to be tough. I think that they bought bought this as kind of a very high end. I mean, 
Lynda.com was already doing a great a great job of uh, you know turning out subscription revenue, and uh, I think that that's going to remain mostly behind a paywall. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because they never were free. I mean, that was just how she started way back in the day when no one else was doing that. So, Yeah, that's I mean, it's a pretty incredible company, and, and certainly don't want to toot, toot your sponsors hard and too much, but, uh, you know, yeah, they, they've been in doing this as long as anybody and, and have been some of the uh, – uh, most experienced people as far as how to uh, create a subscription business that's viable online. Right. And so do we have any idea whether these videos will be aimed at people who are still in school, kids are, you know, high school, college kids, or more for people out there in the the, the, the job world already looking to change a job? You know, I think it's going to be mostly job world. We're, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, looking to retrain workers who who may have lost jobs. You're going to look to train up your existing staff. You're going to look to to partner with major companies that are, are looking for reasons for their staff to stay, things like that. It, it is very kind of, I think it's a secret, you know, not so secret, uh, kind of B2B play that will help bolster uh, LinkedIn's, you know, um, you know, you know, tool, you know, war chest of tools to kind of attract these companies. All right. Well, let's move on to a story. You had another story about uh, how three AT&T employees allegedly sold private information for 68,000 U.S. customers. When and how did this happen? Sure. So this was happening in overseas call centers. Uh, essentially, they were they were being paid by an outside party who was, you know, looking to unlock phones that they had, uh, some stolen, some uh, some not, as we understand. Uh, and you know, basically, what they could do is get these uh, employees to access customer data that could be then used to um, make a request to unlock phones. You unlock those phones, and then you can sell them. It's so interesting to me that it would be that easy to connect a stolen phone to someone's information who had the phone before. Is that is that what you're saying or am I misunderstanding? Yeah, I mean, it's a little unclear right now exactly the uh, mechanism of, of, you know, if it was a particular person's phone or if uh, they had to pair it up. Um, all we know right now is that, you know, a certain amount of data was, was uh, you know, part of the breach, which include names, partial social security numbers, and uh, some account details. So it did seem like if you had a phone, you might be able to, if you could figure out some sort of... Um, you know, information to give these people that they could then look it up and uh, provide with the information you need to uh, submit an unlock request. All right. Now, is this a question of really enterprising cyber criminals or was there just lax security practices on the part of AT&T? I think that this is just, you know, a little bit of a, of a uh, you know, a human problem. You know, they were they were making deals with call center employees who could then access that data. Um, whether AT&T was negligent in allowing them to access that data is tough to say. Um, certainly, it's part of those call centers people's jobs to access you know accounts and things like that. Uh, I, as I understand, ATT has been taking steps, and th- so they, they they've settled with the FCC for the one of the largest uh, um, agreements uh, so far on a data breach. So it's more or less been resolved, and, and the FCC is you know kind of going to be watching what they do. So it is, as far as I know, ATT is taking action, and their reports were were part of the reason that this came to light. Right, and you say that they will offer a year's worth of credit monitoring to victims. I am getting a little bit tired of hearing this. I mean, I already have credit monitoring from the Target hack, from the Anthem hack. I mean, I am getting that. I I don't need any more credit monitoring. I mean, don't they have something else to offer at this point to their victims? We'll see. I mean, I think that that's just the most common sense thing to say that, you know, we're going to make sure that hopefully there is no more harm that comes from this if there has been any, and we're going to try to make sure to prevent it and uh, respond to any that does. Uh, I think for AT&T, you know, if we see these uh, settlement amounts, you know, starting to to grow, people could start seeing, you know, actual money being returned to them because of these breaches. Right. So Mashable had another story uh, yesterday about Oyster. They've been called the Netflix of eBooks. It's a subscription service that lets mm-hmm. you read books on any of your devices. And Oyster announced that they're opening an eBook store and they have support from the biggest publishers. So does that make Oyster in any way a threat to Amazon? A small one, yeah. Um, you know, I think the publishers in particular backing Oyster and, and, and not just Oyster, but a variety of kind of upstart Amazon competitors, uh, you know, that's what they want. And they're, they're going to have to figure out a way to either find one that's going to catch fire and become very popular or, you know, try to incubate a series of them that will hopefully uh, kind of reduce Amazon's power in this space. So, you know, you know it's going to be tough because I think Amazon's name recognition is just the place you go. It's, it's just such a default place. Um, but you know you 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 can't you can't make any, ch- any changes without trying, and we've seen you know, you know companies as powerful as Amazon, if not more, you know fall from grace. And 
And I think, you know, with the power of the, the publishers behind them, if they can start, you know, giving them exclusive deals, anything like, anything like that, you could see, you know, s some competitors start to emerge. And, and Oyster is probably one of the best ones out there right now. Right. And now are they a threat to Apple? I mean, you can buy books through Apple. You can buy them through Google. Are they a threat to, to either of them at all? You know, I think they're probably less of a threat to, to Apple just because they're so, they're so similar. Uh, Apple's probably not terribly worried. And I also think, you know, the book business for Apple seems to be, you know, a smaller part of, of you know, their overall strategy and their overall brand identity than it is for Amazon. Um, but I think everybody's, you know, it's, it's a big market now and everybody's saying to themselves, like, this doesn't need to be a market that only has two or three players. You know, a few, it, it, a few could easily emerge that, uh, you know, get a decent market share. And if Oyster can get even five or 10%, that's enough to give a nice foothold and in, in another place for uh, publishers to to go to. It is interesting. I mean, because the publishers really dislike Amazon and writers do. I mean, they just they they have not done a lot of good to a lot of writers, especially in publishers, independent and the big ones too. So, thank you, Jason. Thank, is there anything else you're working on that you can tell us about? Oh, um, well, <laughs> it's a good question. We got a lot. We got a lot going on here right now. Um, we're looking at a. Uh, you know, how banks are using uh, kind of predictive algorithms and uh, data mining to read through communications to, to prevent fraud. That's something we've got coming down the pipe. And um, I'm also looking at like the broader question of just profitability online. Um, I think uh, you might have seen this week YouTube announced or didn't really announce. It leaked out that YouTube is, is preparing their subscription service. Um, it's kind of another another company that's you know looking to make subscription dollars. Uh, it seemed just a few years ago that nobody could make subscriptions work, and all of a sudden they kind of are. Yeah, I mean, it is a really interesting story. I was actually sorry that I didn't bring it up that we could talk about it because there was a medium piece by Hank Green. I don't know if you th saw that, but he was talking about how he made four million, four billion dollars, I think, on YouTube. But then he's or he made two billion, but he spent four billion, right? Yeah, yeah, that was a really interesting piece, and I, I definitely recommend people read it. I, I can't say that I completely agree with everything uh, that he kind of theorized because some of it is uh, it's very optimistic, let's say. But he raises a, a, a variety of interesting, uh, interesting and important points about how how you know monetizing online is changing and how subscription revenue uh, is is you know an important part of the puzzle, and also just you know how how money should be split. I think YouTube had uh, such a monopoly on online video for so long. People just got used to uh, YouTube taking a large chunk of it. Now with more competitors, uh, that could be that could be getting much smaller. Right. Well, Jason Abraziz, you're the business reporter at Mashable. I always appreciate you answering all of my business tech questions, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Sure. Thanks for having me. Take care. Coming up, Google image searches might be sexist, and is playing your old favorite video games considered hacking? But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to take better photos, learn to code, master Excel, or create an app. lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. Do you want to learn how to develop an app? Check out lynda.com. There are courses on Android Studio Essential Training and Swift Essential Training. They also have courses on building a note-taking app for Android, iOS, and Windows Phone, where they teach you how to create a mobile app from start to finish on the platform of your choice. With a lynda.com membership, you can stream thousands of video courses on demand, complete with transcripts, which allow you to follow along, or you can search for an answer and skip directly to that point in the video. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. So whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, visit lynda.com slash TN2 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. And we thank them for their support. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. GeekWire reports that a University of Washington study used Google image search to test for gender stereotyping. According to the study, only 11% of the top 100 Google image search results for CEO returned images of women. That's compared to the 27% of CEOs in the U.S. who are women. The study was designed to show whether these kind of skewed search results and images could change people's opinions. And according to the study, they could. In fact, 7% of study participants changed their opinions based on manipulated search results. The study also found that in the case of women in professions that didn't match their occupational stereotypes, such as female construction workers, the images of women were more likely to be provocative. And here's another story hot off the geek wire. Amazon is filing lawsuits against two companies who sell fake product reviews 
for about $20 per review. Buy AmazonReviews.com, BuyAzonReviews.com, and BayReviews.net, and BuyReviewsNow.com were all named in the suit. Amazon accuses the companies of false advertising, trademark infringement, and violations of the Anti-Cybersquatting Consumer Protection Act and the Washington Consumer Protection Act. Pre-orders begin for the Apple Watch at 12.01 tonight. Meanwhile, The Verge reports that Google is close to making Android Wear work with the iPhone. According to sources, Google is putting together final technical details on a companion app that would provide advanced features for iPhone users who choose Android Wear over the Apple Watch. People have been able to MacGyver iPhones to work with Android Wear, and iPhones and Android phones already work with the Pebble Watch. But just because Google creates an iOS app for Android Wear doesn't necessarily mean that the Apple Store would approve it. Reviews are in for the Apple MacBook, available tomorrow. We've reported that the new laptop, simply called the MacBook, is thinner, lighter, and has a single port that uses USB-C, which means you'll need an adapter. Not surprisingly, this annoyed people, and many of the reviews echoed those of the Apple Watch. It's too expensive, you'll need one eventually, but not right now. Although Christina Warren from Mashable did say it was a joy and the USB ports did have impressive transfer speeds. I said USB port, I should say. One port. That's all you get. Happy Throwback Thursday, or is it? Did you ever play the D&D-like game Wizardry 1, Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord? I asked two different children of the 70s about this game today, and both of them didn't seem to remember until they looked at the screenshots and their childhood came back to them in a big flash if you do know how to play this game on a laptop now without also downloading malware all over the place, please email me and let me know at megan at twit.tv. I would like to know how. And please also don't tell the Entertainment Software Association because yesterday the EFF said they were asking for an exemption to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act's anti-circumvention provision section 1201 for those who modify older video games that are no longer supported by their publisher. That apparently means downloading games from abandonware sites and accessing games through archive.org is now considered hacking. What do you think about this? Email me feedback to tn2 at twit.tv or to megan at twit.tv. I would love to read some of your opinions on tomorrow's show. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash tn2. You can always write to us at tn2 at twit.tv and you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.